College London Institute of Neurology, and then will be uh, the breakfast of, uh, just after his talk. Thank you very much. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, as some of you will know, I'm slightly outside my comfort zone. In fact, a very, very long way outside my comfort zone. I found the talks this morning intriguing. Uh, a lot of the rhetoric I don't understand, but there's also uh, a lot of curious similarities between many of the issues that we deal with um, in theoretical neurobiology and let me move this higher. I was just saying that I found a lot of the um, the rhetoric and the ideas um, um, slightly mystical uh, that I've been he hearing about, but there was also a lot of formal similarities between some of the issues that we'll, we deal with in theoretical neurobiology, and in particular asking questions about how the brain actively infers and copes and exchanges with its environment. So um, I think... From your perspective, you can regard me as the light entertainment uh, of, of this workshop. Uh, so what I'm going to do is try to um, overview for you the basic principles that we bring to bear when trying to understand uh, action and perception in the brain, uh, with a particular emphasis on um, not geometry per se, but certainly the information geometry and the variation and the variational uh, underpinnings of that, uh, and hopefully touch on some of the issues that we've uh, been hearing about in the previous talks. So let me overview for you what we're going to talk about. I'm going to start off in a very abstract way, just asking some basic questions about the nature of self-organizing systems, and in particular, biological systems. And I'm going to place center stage the boundary between me or an agent and the outside world with which the agent exchanges. And in particular, I'm going to uh, focus on the statistical notion of a Markov blanket that separates me from the rest of the world um, and ask what it means to have a Markov blanket and yet still preserve a, um, an ergodic um, uh, exchange with the world that means that I can uh, preserve certain states or I pursue certain trajectories uh, in terms of my sort of internal and external states. And I'm going to illustrate the nature of those principles just by simulating a little primordial soup and generating a little agent within that primordial soup and performing some experiments upon it. Having established the basic idea and some of the principles, I'm going to tell exactly the same story but from the point of view of a neuroscientist and looking at the form of the variational principles as they might be expressed in the brain and in particular um, looking at the notion of predictive coding and its implementation in canonical microcircuits in the brain. And then I'm going to illustrate those variational principles with a few toy simulations and these are going to be very, very toy from your perspective. They're very simple, but they at least illustrate the basic idea. And I'm going to focus on action and its observation, and then if we have time, uh, conclude with a simulation of eye movements and the sampling of visual information from the world. So I'm going to start, again, I apologize for being very abstract, but I think it's quite important from my perspective at least, just to motivate the underlying, if that's going to be a gradient descent, it's going to be a Gauss-Newton-like <coughs> gradient descent, um, uh, the underlying um, dynamic uh, that, that we're going to be using. So I, I'm going to start here with a question posed by Schrodinger. How can the events in space and time which take place within the spatial boundary of a li living organism be accounted for by physics and chemistry? Now, I'm not going to answer that question, but I'll, what I want to highlight is the notion of a spatial boundary. And in fact, the deeper question underlying this question, how do systems induce and maintain the separation or the spatial boundary between themselves and the rest of the universe. And he would be the first person to acknowledge that that boundary itself 
is a statistical object, um, and in statistics that would con uh, that would con uh, that would be basically a Markov blanket. Um, so a Markov blanket is going to be a statistical boundary between some internal states of the system, which I'll denote by blue here, and external states in cyan here, that provides an insulation of a statistical sort between, say, my states and the states of the rest of the world. So uh, I, I'm... How many people here know what a Markov blanket is? Good. Could you explain to your friends what a Markov blanket is? <laughs> yes, I think so. That was very succinct and absolutely correct. Okay, <laughs> let, let me briefly unpack that for. In fact, I'm joking. I think most of you here do know what a Markov blanket is. So, can you put your hand up if you know what a Markov process is? Yeah. So you all know essentially what a Markov blanket is. So, in a, with a with a Markov process in time, the Markov blanket is just the preceding state. So it's just, as he says, it's just the states you would need to know. Um, that contain all the information about the rest of possible knowledge in all the remaining states in order to predict the, uh, the state of reference or the internal states here. So I, if I wanted to predict this state, given the causal influences of all other states, it would be sufficient just to know the Markov blanket, and I don't need to know all the remaining. So these are now conditionally independent of these or vice versa, conditioned upon the Markov blanket. And the Markov blanket comprises the parents and the children and the parents of the children of the state. Now, from our point of view, there's an interesting bipartition on that Markov blanket um, that is induced just by considering states that are and states that are not influenced by the internal states. So, for any system that can be written down in this form in terms of statistical dependencies, there will exist a Markov blanket, and that Markov blanket can always be split into two sets, which I'm going to call active states and um, in, uh, sensory states. And I'm, I'm going to motivate those labels just by asking you to consider that causal structure in relation to things that we know and love, bio biotic or biological things, from sim single cells through to, say, brains here. So the internal states would correspond to all the internal states of a cell. The uh, active states could be the actin filaments that uh, support the surface states or the sensory states and provide the cell with motility, while the sensory states uh, uh, are caused by external states here that in turn influence internal states that cause changes in active states that again couple back to the environment. And exactly the same slightly sparse causal structure can be found in the brain. We have the internal states of the brain, all the synaptic activities, connection strengths and the like that influence and cause changes in our actuators or effector organs that influence or change the external states that are registered by sensory states that in turn um, change the internal states. So I'm just saying that for any system, uh, any organism or agent or robot embedded in a larger system, uh, we can always apply this partition provided certain conditional independences uh, exist. And in fact, they have to exist in order to produce a, a distinction between me and the rest of the world through my Markov blanket. I'm now going to ask you to forget about that uh, because what we're going to do is now just look at the generic behavior of all interesting systems and then come back and put the Markov blanket back into the equation and see what the implications are for the behavior of the sensory states, the internal states, and the action states. So just to motivate, so this is going to be one of a couple of slides with lots of equations or some equations on. And this is the basic slide that motivates the variational approach, uh, information geometric approach to the dynamics of these systems. And what I'm doing here is, in an abstract way, just taking any um, random dynamical uh, system where I'm lumping together uh, states of the world and control states into X and adding random fluctuations. And I'm presupposing that we're only going to be talking about systems that have measurable characteristics that persist over time. So by definition, they are uh, ergodic in a, a weak sense. 
and that implies the existence of a random dynamical attractor. So we have two states here, uh, and they trace out um, uh, a manifold or an attracting set here as time evolves with multiple trajectories. And we can interpret that ensemble of trajectories or attracting set in terms of an egotic probability. The probability that I sampled the system at any point in time, the probability that I would find it in that state would be denoted by the density here of these trajectories. So this could be, say, uh, the states of a system whilst walking, for example. So <coughs> if this attracting set exists, if the system exists, then it is equipped with, or it has this probabilistic uh, description um, that um, can be described by uh, the Fokker-Planck equation. Is, is this a familiar object to many people here? Who, yeah, okay. Also known as the master equation, the Kolmogorov forward equation, lots of different names. Uh, for those people who don't know, it's relatively simple. I'll, just, I'll, I'll explain what it does in a second. But from our perspective, its form is not terribly important. What is important is, is its solution. Because if this attracting set exists, then the rate of change of this probability is zero, which means I can rearrange the solution to express the flow of states as a function of the <coughs> gradients of the log probability distribution. So this is the solution that I'm going to appeal to. And it is this one solution here that I'm going to use as a variational principle to understand all internal state changes and all action um, uh, of the systems that, uh, that exist. Uh, just heuristically, for those people who are not familiar uh, with the, with the Fokker-Planck formalism, it's very simple. All it's saying here is that if you imagine just dropping um, uh, uh, so a, a, a drop of ink into the ocean, then these random uh, fluctuations here will disperse the concentration of the ink throughout the ocean. So in that instance, it wouldn't have an attracting set. It wouldn't have behaviours that we can measure and admire or put on YouTube. Um, so it must be the case, then, that there is some deterministic flow that is countering the dispersive forces. So it's acting in opposition to the dispersion which degrades areas of high concentration, high probability uh, distribution or density. In other words, it's actually flowing towards regions of high concentration. And when those two uh, dispersive and deterministic flow components are in balance, then the system becomes, um, attains non-equilibrium steady state and is uh, weakly ergodic. And that's all that we're describing here. This equation here is just uh, an expression of the Helmholtz uh, decomposition. It's just, it's just expressing this flow in terms of a hill climbing or gradient ascent on the log probability um, and a solenoidal or divergence free component that actually breaks the detailed bounds of, these, of, of, a, of a system in general. And we're going to use both terms later on in a way which I think many of you will, will be more familiar with. Um, this cartoon is just to show that there are two components to this flow. But the essence is that the flow of any system should it exist has to do a hill climbing on this log probability. So now let's go back and put the Markov blanket back into the mix. And let's do it in terms of the states that constitute me, my sensory states, my active states, and my internal states. Now that uh, hill climbing behavior is still true, which means it is still the case that all my internal states will try to maximize the log uh, ergodic probability, and all my actions, all my behaviors, my active states, will also try to maximize this quantity here. And I'm going to associate these with perception and action and try and motivate that for you um, in the rest of the talk. But just to pause for a moment and just think about what this quantity means depending upon where you were uh, educated or what community you come from. What we're saying is that the system will appear to self-organize internally and behave in a way that it's going to maximize this quantity, which is just the energy of states it thinks it should be in, it likes to occupy. It's just the valuable states, the adaptive states. From, from this we can then derive, or at least form a conceptual bridge to things like reinforcement learning, optical control theory, accepted utility theory, and the like. The negative value is just the self-informational surprisal or surprise. 
So any system that exists will be trying to, in an information theoretic sense, trying to minimize its surprise. And then that brings us to the principle of maximum mutual information, minimum redundancy, and the free energy principle, where free energy here uh, provides a, uh, an upper variational bound or approximation to the surprise itself. The time integral, the path integral over any trajectory, well, because of the ergodic assumption, is the entropy. And that's nice because the, what this means is there's a resistance to the second law. It's resisting an increase in entropy. And, of course, that is the holy grail of self-organization, synergetics. But, of course, it's just the statement of homeostasis. It's just saying that systems, biological systems, that reduce a tendency to disorder, keep themselves within physiological bounds. And we've seen very nice examples of bounds in terms of, uh, say, um, the constraints on various loss functions or cost functions. Now, as a statistician, you will also notice that this quantity, or e to the surprise, is the probability of sensory data given me. But if I interpret me as a model of my um, me and my environment, then this is also known as model evidence. It's the probability of the sensory samples conditioned upon me existing or the model existing, which means that this can be interpreted, this maximization of this quantity here can be interpreted in terms of the Bayesian brain, evidence accumulation, and predictive coding. Uh, and that's, these two perspectives are what, what I want to pursue and try and unpack in terms of process theories of how the brain might work and how it might act. So just to give you a very quick flavor of how um, the nature of the dynamics that I've just described, what I've done here is just simulate a little primordial soup using 128 macromolecules that I've given autonomous dynamics using a Lorentz attractor, so that each one has, a, uh, has its own dynamics um, uh, of electrochemical sort. And there's spatial relationships determining uh, forces amongst the molecules with weak electrochemical attraction and strong uh, repulsion as a, 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 an inverse function of the Euclidean separation. And just lumping these uh, little macromolecules together, they sort of bubble away quite happily, showing um, they attain non-equilibrium steady state quite quickly. The details of the simulation are completely unimportant. You get exactly the same behavior, whatever, whatever loosely coupled dynamical system you put, you write down. You put a little bit of random fluctuations in, in it, and it, it will um, show this sort of behavior in one parameter regime. <coughs> the reason I've done that is because I've written down the equations of motion, and I now know the physical separation and the statistical coupling between these molecules. I now know that graphical structure, that adjacency matrix, which means, in principle, I can go in there and find some internal states and their Markov blanket, and I can then look at that system and then do experiments on it to try and illustrate the two um, behaviors that I was referring to before. So what I've done here is just reproduce exactly the um, movie that we had on the previous uh, slide. But here I've color-coded the internal states in blue here, a little ring here with a uh, small tail, the active states um, in red that surround the internal state and support the sensory states or the surface states that are exposed to the external states in Siam here. And this thing just wiggles around, just flapping its, its tail, quite happily exchanging, again, in non-equilibrium steady state uh, with the environment. Uh, for those of you interested, uh, it's very easy to find these, um, these structures. Uh, you just need to identify the Markov blanket matrix, which uh, constitutes uh, or is constituted by the parents, the children, the parents of the children, uh, and then split it into the uh, active and sensory states using the, look, the, the uh, rule that I described before. So what I've now got is a synthetic little organism that I can now ask, does action maintain the structure and functional integrity of this, uh, often referred to in terms of things like autopoiesis, and do the internal states act as little Bayesian engines or infer the hidden causes of their sensory states, namely active inference. Um, so just briefly to illustrate uh, the sorts of things which we do as neuroscientists, which we're basically performing brain lesions or studying people with strokes. This is uh, an illustration of what happens when you perturb the system. So here are the locations of those, all the uh, elements of that little 
um, organism here, um, reported in terms of their locations over 512 seconds uh, under normal progression. And these three panels show the equivalent locations where I've made mild lesions to either the active states, and these are very mild, I'm just rendering them insensitive to the electrochemical interactions coupling. So this would be like paralyzing the agent, the sensory states by uh, making it blind, or giving it a little stroke by lesioning the internal states. And the key thing, the obvious thing here, is that whatever I do, I basically kill the organism. I destroy its equilibrium. Um, and indeed, uh, we can assume now that the, um, the, the, you know, the proper maintenance um, of its structure and function did depend upon that hill climbing behavior that I've uh, illustrated in the first few slides. Technically, this is actually known as oscillator death um, and um, is closely related to something else, generalized synchronization, which I'll, I'll mention in a second. Here's the second illustration. Here, just for illustrative purpose, or to make a heuristic point anyway, um, I'm asking the question, is there anything in, or do, do the electrochemical states of the internal states predict the physical motion of the outside world. So this would be like a brain imaging experiment where I present some moving stimuli in the outside world and I look for evoked responses in the uh, visual cortex of um, uh, the brain. Uh, and it's very easy to find um, uh, mixtures here, that all the internal states lagged over time, find linear mixtures that do indeed predict the motion of external states here, the degree of prediction color-coded by the um, the, this, uh, um, the depth of this cyan colouring. Here's the most predictable motion of the most predictable uh, external molecule um, in, shown in, 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 uh, as a dotted line and the prediction as a solid line. Uh, and what's happening, uh, occasionally this, uh, this, this molecule here gets expelled from the soup and then falls back again. And it seems as if this thing is actually predicting or registering these external events, despite the fact that they are statistically conditionally independent, they're separated by the Markov blanket. But the reason I'm showing this example is you can almost see the fluctuation in internal states, the evoked response associated with this outside uh, motion event here. But if you look carefully, you can see that the changes in the internal states actually precede the external states, which begs an important question. Are the internal states causing the external states, or is the external fluctuation uh, causing and registering a representation of a statistical sort in the internal states? And of course, the answer is both. Um, all we're seeing here is... Um, an illustration of, of generalized synchrony. So uh, I, I'm sure you all know this, but this is the phenomena where if, uh, originally observed by Huygens, where you have multiple clocks hanging from the same wall or beam, and ultimately they have to come to swing in synchrony. There is, that is their only um, long-term attracting state. Um, this is one of his drawings here to illustrate two clocks suspended by the same beam. And that's all we're seeing here. We're seeing a generalized synchrony between internal and external states just by the very existence of these random dynamical attractors. Uh, and here we can think about one clock have, uh, comprising the internal states, uh, the other clock the external states, and their Markov blanket, the beam or the wall from which they are suspended. I, I like this example because it highlights the complete symmetry of what's going on here. So if you subscribe to this idea that we are uh, trying to predict and model our world, what this means is that the world is trying to model you in an exactly sy symmetrical way. The world is watching you in exactly the same way that you are watching the world. So that's all the, um, the sort of heavy lifting uh, done from the point of view of the uh, self-organization. To summarize, and the existence of a Markov blanket necessarily implies a partition of states into internal states, a Markov blanket, namely sensory and active states, and external or hidden states. And because active states change, but are not changed by external states, they minimize the entropy of internal states in the Markov blanket, which means that action will appear to maintain the structural and functional integrity of the Markov blanket. And at the same time, internal states will appear to infer 
the hidden causes of sensory states by maximizing Bayesian model evidence and influence those uh, hidden causes through action and we're going to refer to that as active inference. So now what I want to do is just repeat exactly the same story but using um, a different rhetoric and the sorts of ideas and perspectives that you'd find in psychology and uh, neuroscience but we're going to be appealing to exactly the same ideas. The only slight difference here is that previously I had written down a simulation where the um, that value function or cost function or that surprise function was an emergent property of the differential equations. Here I'm actually going to write down the, um, the ergodic density in terms of prior beliefs about the, uh, about the, the states that um, agents like to occupy. But the, uh, the actual simulations and solutions that I'm going to show you are based upon exactly the same uh, differential equation, hill climbing equation, um, and in fact the same code. So where this sort of talk normally starts is with Helmholtz. So now we're talking about the brain um, and the brain as a constructive, uh, an organism that constructs predictions and explanations for its sensory inputs. Uh, beautifully articulated in terms, uh, in, by this quote here, objects are always imagined as being present in the field of vision as would have to be there in order to produce the same impression on the nervous system. So the brain is providing descending predictions of, uh, or explanations or hypotheses for the sensory input and is updating or revising its internal hypotheses uh, in order to account for the sensory evidence at hand. And this of course is very closely related to the notion of perception as hypothesis testing by Richard Gregory and has been formalized and articulated by people like Peter Dan and Jeffrey Hinton uh, uh, from a Bayesian perspective borrowing from um, uh, variational principles in particular variational free energy uh, invented by Richard Feynman to solve the, um, uh, his particular uh, quantum electrodynamical problems using path integral or approximations to uh, the, uh, path integral problems. So that's what um, we're going to, uh, this is the perspective we're going to pursue. This quote is nice in the sense that it, uh, it, it induces this notion of a, a sensory impression on the nervous system, which of course is very much like the sensory states being or reflecting um, external influences. So the external states are impressing themselves on the, uh, the Markov blanket or this veil um, to produce the sensory impressions. And if it is the case that the internal states are maximizing the Bayesian model evidence, they are implicitly inferring the causes in the outside world uh, that produce that. So let's see what that might look like, how that might be implemented in a simple brain-like organism. So here's our basic hill climbing equation again uh, in its Helmholtz form. Uh, I'm replacing the surprise with the free energy bound here. So we've actually got a gradient descent on the free energy here with its uh, 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 divergence-free and um, curl-free components, so noidal components. Um, I'm just rewriting this equation in a form that might be more familiar uh, to many of you. It's basically a Kalman filter. Um, so the, um, the sorry, noidal component now becomes a prediction in the sense that prediction can't change the model evidence because there's no new data. So it... it um, it doesn't change the uh, log probability, it just flows on the ISO contours. Whereas the update does the hill climbing, and that's just a minimization of prediction error weighted by the precision of the prediction error, um, multiplied by the precision of the random fluctuations uh, or, uh, here. So what's prediction error? We've heard about that a number of times. Um, it's basically the difference between observations and some, uh, some reference. Um, here, let's assume that we have these sensory imp impressions and that we were trying to predict the cause of these sensory impressions given some expectation mu here. And if I had a generative model or a forward model given these expectations of what the sensory consequences of these expected causes were, I can then produce a prediction in sensory data space or sensor space, look at the difference and we'll call that the prediction error. And then all we're saying is that if a system exists, then you should be able to write it down so it looks as if it is always trying to minimize its prediction error, both 
by changing its internal states, which now stand in for uh, uh, expectations of the causes, uh, and through its action. Um, notice that there's no imperative here to actually model the true um, external states. It is just a statement that it is sufficient to understand the dynamics in terms of minimization of prediction error. So the actual cause can be very different from the, uh, the true cause. So that is good in the sense that we've boiled down um, all the behavior to a suppression of prediction error. And that uh, provides a, a simple uh, or intuitive perspective on perception and action in the sense we can either change our brains to make our predictions more like the sensations or we can actually change the way that we're sampling the sensations to make them more like the predictions, both in the service of minimizing prediction error. Uh, and this provides, if you like, the metaphor for action and perception that I was talking about previously. But if this rests upon prediction errors, then clearly I have to have a model that generates predictions. Um, and it's at this point that we start to get into some of the hard problems now. Um, so let's just think about the nature of the generative models that would actually generate data that a humanoid robot or a human um, actually samples from the world. And let's say you set your students the task of generating um, foveal sampling from a synthetic retina. Now to do that, just to generate the data, let's not worry about inferring or inverting any model, just to generate the data, you're going to have to know the hidden causes, the what and the where of um, what uh, of the causes of these sensory data. So you need to know what was what is the object being visually palpated, what is where are we uh, looking, what are the kinetics of that um, uh, um, saccadic search, and then we'd mix these two causes um, with a cascade of nonlinear convolution operators, uh, nonlinear mappings at different hierarchical levels to finally produce the actual sampled data. I've just written down that deep and dynamic generative or forward model here in terms of hidden uh, states or causes and hidden states per se, all subject to random fluctuations, eventually generating sensory uh, consequences right at the bottom. And now, if we apply our hill climbing um, function to this, and then rewrite the message passing implicit in this gradient descent here, using the sort of the camera filter-based uh, formulation of this, we actually get a very, very similar architecture. We replace the random fluctuations with prediction errors, but the expectations, which now replace the hidden states, have exactly the same form. They're just cascading down, generating predictions of the expectations at lower levels, right down to the bottom uh, error, uh, 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 level. Now, the interesting thing here, from the point of view of a, 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 a neuroanatomist, is that we actually create forward or ascending uh, connections or message passing where the prediction errors are propagated up or deep into the hierarchy to update or correct our expectations. So there's a reciprocal message passing with descending predictions and a counter stream of ascending prediction errors all being mixed together in a relatively simple way. Um, although the, the, uh, there are nonlinearities in this because the predictions of, um, in the prediction errors are generated by nonlinear uh, descending um, uh, influences here. But a fast, simple, and efficient way basically to map from consequences, sensitive consequences, back to causes in a way that is consistent with, min with maximizing Bayesian model evidence. So just intuitively, from the point of view of, uh, again, say a visual neuroscientist. Um, let's just see how that might pan out in terms of anatomy and physiology. We have sensory input coming in here. There are top-down predictions from the visual cortex. They are compared to elaborate a prediction error. That prediction error is passed up to the visual hierarchy to revise expectations about the causes of that, say, local pattern of sensory input. But these predictions or expectations themselves are in receipt of higher predictions, which form a second level prediction error that can be sent up the hierarchy to revise higher and higher, more abstract, hierarchically deep um, representations. And we've heard about the importance of sort of dimension reduction and factorization. And in 
the formation or in the use of these hierarchical models that are defined by their factorization, their sparsely structure, this is where you get the dimension reduction, the efficient um, representation or explanation for sensory input. Uh, we can tell exactly the same story for proprioceptive input. So proprioceptive input from stretch receptors here in the ocular motor system coming to the uh, pontine nuclei in receipt of top-down predictions, say from the frontal eye fields. We have a prediction error that could be sent forward to revise our beliefs about the configuration of our uh, ocular motor system um, and provide a base optimal explanation for that. But, and here's the important thing, these prediction errors have another way of suppressing themselves. They can couple directly back to the actuators to make the stretch correspond to the descending proprioceptive prediction. So they can eliminate themselves quickly and efficiently just by coupling back to the environment. So this is the action. This is basically action minimizing prediction error here. Notice that the only thing that um, action can change are the prediction errors at the first level, not deep in the hierarchy. And what I've just described there is simply a reflex arc, nothing more, nothing less. In this perspective, basically the descending predictions provide the reference for the reflexes to fulfill. So action is in the game, again, of changing the sampled sensations to make them more like the predictions, including the predictions about the motor plant. And in fact, only in this instance about the, the motor plant. Uh, so we only have the reflexes right at the bottom of the, of the hierarchy. Um, so these predictions, of course, are not simple. They are richly informed by deep hierarchical processing and gathering together of all information from all modalities. So these are descending predictions that are just in the proprioceptive domain, but they are all internally consistent with beliefs about the world and its history that have, been, uh, that have benefited from the accumulation of multimodal information. So these are very rich descending predictions, but their actual um, realization by the motor plant is trivial. It's just driven by uh, the, uh, the reflex arc here. So these would be basically the, re the reference signals uh, that we were uh, hearing about earlier on. So to summarize that before I conclude with a couple of illustrations, biological agents minimize their average surprise, namely their entropy. They uh, do this by suppressing prediction. Or you can write this down uh, in terms of a suppression of prediction error. And that can be reduced by either changing the predictions, namely perception or sensations through action. And this, certainly the scheme, the predictive processing or Kalman filtering scheme that I've just described, uh, entails recurrent message passing to optimize predictions. And action reflexively makes those predictions come true and thereby minimizes surprise. So um, if let me just now conclude by giving you a, a, a working through three examples that sort of build upon each other. Um, which maybe um, speak more to robotics than... Um, have I, I've got enough time, haven't I? Yeah? So... Um, no, 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 no. 20 minutes. 20 minutes. I was just about to accelerate there into hyperdrive. Now I'm more relaxed again now. 15 minutes. 15 minutes. So, five, all right, then we'll leave time for discussion. Um, so the first... Uh, the first uh, so I was trying to think how all the ideas I've been, uh, I've been hearing about this morning fit with this scheme. And there are lots of points of contact, but there are also points of confusion for me. So I'm hoping that some of that will be resolved by, by the audience. Um, <coughs> and often the, my confusion is resolved by going back to these simple toy examples that, that you know, self-evidently work. Um, so the first example is, was basically, how would you simulate cued reaching? So there's some change in the environment that cues a particular movement, and that movement is just uh, reaching to target. So this is actually a trivial uh, uh, thing to solve um, from the point of view of this active inference scheme, and just involves putting into the model the prior beliefs that when a target changes color, there is an invisible spring or an invisible spring that is uh, connected from the target to the tip of the agent's finger becomes very stiff and pulls the finger to the target. So in the absence of any cue change, that string has no stiffness, but as soon as the target changes, the agent believes that 
there is an attractive force pulling its finger towards the target. Now, if it believes that, then, and that is part of its generative model, then it will expect to see and feel its arm move to the target. And action will reflexively fulfill that. And in so doing, will also fulfill the visual predictions. And this is basically the sort of behavior we get when the target changes uh, from uh, uh, green to red. Uh, uh, and this is just a schematic of the implementation by reflexes through action of the, these descending proprioceptive predictions here. So I think the interesting point here is that the forward model that implicitly resolves um, the you know, multiple degrees of freedom um, problem is very simple and it's got absolutely nothing to do with the real world. The real world does not contain springs. The, the actual model is almost a heuristic and heuristic used in a very good sense. So I think heuristics you know, they sometimes come along with a slightly negative connotation. But in fact, heuristics are your prize in approximate Bayesian inference. They are at the heart of everything. And as you know, at the very end of the final presentation, we have this sort of hierarchical decomposition, almost you know, appealing to heuristics at the very high-level constructs. This, I think, formally is exactly the same as a, high, a deep hierarchical generative model where the priors induce, they're called empirical priors, since you have a hierarchical model, they, they are heuristics. Uh, they're neither right nor wrong. But of course, once you get the action for making them come true, they become right, provided they are allowable. So if you've got the right heuristics, they are true. They're just prior beliefs. And in this instance, these prior beliefs uh, uh, resolve the usual in, uh, sort of motor control problem because you're actually pulling, not pushing. You don't have to solve a, a pushing problem. You're solving a pulling problem by use of this particular and um, very simple uh, prior heuristic or prior belief uh, that's just part of the, a very simple part of the differential equation that constitute the hierarchical generative model. So this example essentially uses a point attractor. So the, equ the equations of motion that describe this prior belief or this heuristic um, have a fixed uh, attracting point. The next example just takes exactly the same idea, but with two twists. First of all, we are going to make the target invisible. And now it's not going to have a point attractor. The location of this fictive target is now going to uh, pursue a heteroclinic cycle. Um, and we've heard about central pattern generators. I'm just writing down now a central pattern ger generator. Uh, it actually has a Volterra Lotka form uh, that produces a heteroclinic cycle uh, that attracts the fictive location of this um, point in Euclidean or uh, uh, extrapersonal space to a series of unstable fixed points. And again, it, it did strike me that the notion of computing your points of contact and then working out the dynamics has a lot of similarity in the way that one chunks and sequences. But what we're doing here, we're saying that this one equation, it's actually a very simple equation, I repeat, a lot of Volterra um, differential equation, that has a number of unstable fixed points that are visited in sequence. This is just nothing more or less than a central pattern generator. And then there's a, a, a mapping from the location in this abstract space to some points in a 2D planar space that attract the finger in exactly the same way that the point attractor uh, attracted the finger before. And by just putting these points here um, in uh, an appropriate place, I can simulate the writing that you've just, uh, just seen uh, uh, being traced out there. Now, so th that's an interesting simulation from the biologist's point of view because the activity of the units that are encoding these prior beliefs and generating predictions that are fulfilled by action um, do actually show a lot of characteristics that people in neuroscience are familiar with. So, for example, if I plot the activity of one of these in terms of the position in space, we get place cell activity. Furthermore, we get place cell activity that has direction seal activity. It prefers the downstroke as opposed to the upstroke of the J here. And another nice thing about this simulation it actually shows that, or it allows me to remind myself and remind you, all this behavior is being produced by deep dynamic descending predictions 
in the proprioceptive domain. At the same time, the agent is making visual predictions and seeing the consequences of its behavior, and it's well happy because those predictions are completely fulfilled. However, if I just reduce the gain on these descending predictions, I now have a, and replay the same visual input, I now have a simulation scenario where it will be like the agent watching somebody else write. And yet it can use exactly the same forward model to infer the trajectory and what is being written. Um, and I've simulated that here in terms of looking uh, at the activity of this unit here when I've precluded m movement by switching off the gain of these descending predictions but left these in play and then ex um, replayed the visual input uh, to the agent and it excites exactly the same um, selective responses in the same forward model. So it's using this generative model that has multimodal extraceptive and proprioceptive predictions in the one hand to prescribe behavior through descending proprioceptive predictions, but also in another context it can prescribe the extraceptive or visual con or auditory consequences of another's behavior. So it can also accumulate sensory evidence to infer what something else, what another robot was doing. Of course that's uh, 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 um, basically the premise of the mirror neuron system um, which uh, this provides a very crude model of. Okay, finally, um, what we did there was write down um, explicitly um, the number of the attracting locations. What I want to do now is to show you the last, um, uh, the last um, simulation that, that um, asks the question, well, how do we... In, in visual neuroscience, um, identify the points of attraction, the next point of attraction in this sort of heteroclinic itinerant sampling um, of our uh, sensory space. Um, and the way that I'm going to uh, uh, choose those is, this is the second equation here. Uh, uh, the way I'm going to choose those is actually quite principled. It, um, I won't go into the arguments now, but basically it rests upon um, the following argument, that if it is the case that all systems that exist in an ergodic sense can be written down in terms of minimizing their variation-free energy. And if it is the case that the behavior of all systems is, is determined by the empirical priors or the priors inherent in their model that forms the basis of that free energy, their heuristics, what are the only necessary heuristics to explain the existence of a system that doesn't go off, to um, off exponentially to plus or minus infinity. Well, it's just that they believe that they minimize free energy. So if a system believes it minimizes free energy in the future, then it will act to fulfill that belief and it will therefore minimize free energy and it will therefore exist. So what does that mean in terms of understanding the imperatives for planned action or, if you like, goal-directed action? Um, I haven't got... Uh, I, I won't go into this. It is a very interesting... Um, sort of uh, game, if one writes out the full expression for expected free energy in, in the future, it actually entails a lot of interesting things that subsume optimal control and KL control. Um, but I'm actually taking the sort of the, um, the interesting bits out of the loss function that make it the sort of loss functions that you would deal with and just le uh, uh, looking at what is left. And what is actually left is the information gain or the epistemic value, the reduction in uncertainty I would get if I move like this. So as applied to the visual domain, that simply means that we're going to, the point attractors of our eyes, our ocular motor system, are going to be those movements that harvest or solicit or elicit sensory samples that m reduce my uncertainty about uh, the, the, uh, the state of the world. And we can compute that, so if I have this hypothesis about that this image was causing my local sensory samples here. I can move this circle around, compute the uh, decrease in uh, expected free energy conditioned upon that uh, control um, and score it in terms of uh, information gain or epistemic value and create a salience map. I can now use the maxima of those salience maps to drive that itinerant searching exactly uh, uh, that we illustrated in the previous slide. Here's the architecture. I won't uh, go into this, it's not very interesting. I think the more interesting thing here is the behavior. So here, the locations of the su successive 
autonomous, autonomously selected now attracting points for successive, successive fixations here in movie format. These are the data that are sampled, simulated EOGs or uh, electrical uh, eye movement recordings, the visual samples at the end of each saccade. And this is the interesting thing. In this simulation, this very simple agent had beliefs that the world could either be an upside down face, uh, a sideways face, or a vertical face. Um, and it then sampled information to resolve its uncertainty or confusion about what the state of the world was that was causing its sensory information. Um, that's now uh, shown here in terms of the expectations for the correct explanation, which was the upright face. Uh, and the incorrect explanations and the 90% Bayesian confidence intervals, just to show that there is a within saccard and between, saltatory between saccard reduction and transient inflation of uncertainty as this agent goes and gathers bits of bit, um, uh, information that progressively resolves its uncertainty about what's going on uh, beyond its Markov blanket. Um, and clearly, if any evidence violated or disconfirmed its hypothesis, it would then move to the next uh, competing hypothesis, uh, very much in, uh, like a sort of winnerless, uh, as one would in a winnerless competition or a winner-take-all like situation. So I'll conclude with that example. Uh, it would have been nice to show a further example that spoke more directly to robotics, but I don't have one, I'm sorry, because uh, um, we haven't got, uh, we haven't really uh, got uh, that far, nor, nor is that our expertise. But I will close with uh, a quote from Helmholtz that I think, again, wonderfully summarizes everything that I've just said. Um, Each movement we make by which we alter the appearance of objects should be thought of as an experiment designed to test whether we would have understood correctly the invariant relations of the phenomena before us, that is, their existent, existence in definite spatial relations. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, all the people whose ideas I've been talking about. And, of course, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. Any questions? Um, I have a question that relates to your pointing example mm -hmm. that you then extended to a repetition development. So, based on data, I would say that in the human movements, the stringing together of a sequence of fixed points develops into a smooth movement. So, how would you? I think that's a very nice question. I think it speaks to the progression from that fixed point to this uh, educated cycle. This, if you like, really one step up from a linear cycle. So, well, if I had, if I thought about this presentation before uh, putting together the, uh, the slides, uh, it would be nice to progress from a fixed point to a linear cycle to create a behavior through to a full educated cycle. Um, uh, uh, this is actually, I think, the in terms of complexity, if I was writing down a really interesting simulation, I repeat, I haven't done this. Uh, but if I, if I, if I, if I thought about what, what an interesting hierarchical dynamic uh, and deep model would look like, I think we would have uh, very slow, sorry, very slow hectic channels at the top that would have faster sequences of heterogeneous channels below them that would ultimately come down to uh, wooded cycles. Uh, so that we have coordinated and contextualized embedded sequences of oscillatory behavior, such as in moving or in walking. Uh, with the exception of things like, uh, well, actually, uh, we can uh, use the kind of diary ones. Um, we have microsecars under them. So, yeah, I think we would have a collection of different mathematical attractive sets, all contextualizing each other. And just from experience in other, uh, in other simulations, what tends to happen is that when you write down the heuristics, when you write down the prize in terms of differential equations, the states of the higher level capital tend to act as control parameters at the, on the lower level parameter. 
uh, did remind me very much of the coefficients that we were hearing about before. Remember, uh, it was coefficients times uh, a function which was a text attribute of the dictionary, a reference RT uh, versus uh, 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 samples. Uh, so it did strike me that's very much like where you are forced to end up in writing down um, sort of realistic simulations. So I would imagine dynamics that have attractive sets possibly all the forms that you can down on that. Uh, increasingly slower time scales where the high level device control count is for the low level. And we should get more sequences of sequences of sequences to free from that sense of Is that what you had in mind? I sort of skipped over that, but the, 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 there would be a whole, I think, um, uh, community of people who could come and lecture on the importance of variational free energy in approximate Bayesian inference that is exactly to finesse that problem. So if I understand your problem, oh, sorry, the, the problem you're, 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 you're highlighting, if it were the case that one could actually evaluate P of S, if you could actually estimate surprise or value, then in principle you could just work out the gradients with respect to control variables and with respect to internal states and, uh, and then just write down uh, the differential equations of an, you know, a very adaptive agent uh, that could be... Uh, and one should add that every, every aspect, including the parameters, would have to minimise free energy and if you write that down that becomes associative learning and somatic time. It then becomes natural selection or Bayesian model selection in evolutionary time. But everything minimizes that log energy, that log surprise, but of course you can't measure it. Uh, and as I understand it, this is exactly the prob problem that Richard Feynman uh, confronted when he was trying to solve the uh, pathological problem to work out the probability of um, trajectories of small particles, you know, let's say electrons. Um, and it can't be analytically solved and it certainly can't be done possibly over evolutionary time with some uh, as, you know, MCF sampling uh, technique, but in real time that can't be done. Hence the free energy. So the free energy provides an analytic bound that is really easy to measure, but it renders now your optimal dynamic no longer is it exact Bayesian inference, it now becomes known as approximate Bayesian inference. So the whole point of the free energy principle as opposed to just maximizing uh, Bayesian model evidence or um, min, uh, maximizing, minimizing surprise is that it allows exactly for that. It provides a tractable re, uh, finessing of the problem that you're talking about. So everything I've talked about is approximate Bayesian inference um, which lends another aspect I guess to the use of the word heuristics here. So the free energy which is always by definition by Gibbs inequality um, bigger than the, um, the the thing that we'd like to measure, which is the log of the probability itself, um, now can be written down in this form. So, uh, and then it has a, a flavour and a feel where, where, where suddenly you feel comfortable because you you know and talk about likelihood models. We know and talk about priors. If you're comfortable with hierarchical models or deep models, you will also be comfortable with the notion of parametric empirical uh, Bayes and uh, empirical priors. Um, so these are the things that you are forced to do when doing modelling because we cannot measure, usually for nonlinear models, the actual thing we want to uh, approximate, which is the probability of S. So probability of S given M does not appear in this equation, but what we now have to do is to write down the priors and the likelihood explicitly. And notice that the entropy term is on the end here. So this conforms to James's maximum entropy principle. Um, so we're trying to maximise basically the accuracy of our model 
whilst at the same time um, maximising the entropy or the uncertainty in our explanation. It's slightly paradoxical, but this is what leads to um, the generalisation and the, simpli the simplicity, the simplicity uh, of, of the approximate Bayesian solutions. And again, I you was know, thinking about your presentations. Um, you know, that part of that that that's, uh, simplicity, I'm sure, is an appalling abuse of the word. But the the minimisation of the complexity that you would you get from including this entropy term uh, tells you, or usually makes it the case that. Um, sparse models with nice sparse hierarchical structures with low dimensions as a as the sort of expl explanations for high dimensional data uh, have much more um, evidence or more exactly lower free energy than models that don't have that low dimensionality. So you, you can actually write this equation out in a number of different ways, and and that complexity becomes a KL divergence between the posterior and the prior, and that the determinant of that complexity, which is all part of this completely standard free energy variation, free energy variation based ensemble learning formalism, you get for free when you um, use low dimensional hierarchical models of your data. So I think there's a principal drive to getting to those good heuristics that have that low dimensionality. With that hierarchical temporal structuring we've been talking about, it's actually mandated by the very nature of the problem that we're trying to solve or trying to explain. Is that okay? I actually have a technical question. <laughs> so this uh, relationship between um, Bayesian inference and, and optimal control that, that you, you pointed out, of course it's an old idea going back to Kalman and in his world, in the, in the linear world, they're one-to-one -one just like you're describing them. But later there was work by Mitter and Fleming in the nonlinear case and then I did something and Bert Kaplan did something relating it to path integrals. And Collectively, we figured out that control is actually a much bigger problem than Bayesian inference. Specifically, what that means is that there is a subclass of stochastic optimal control problems that map one-to-one -to, -one to Bayesian inference involving the same dynamical system. But there are infinitely many other stochastic optimal control problems that do not have an inference analog. And the reason is very simple, actually. If you look at Bayes' rule and the Fokker-Planck and the Kushner equation, they're all linear. The hamilton chikori bellman equation is nonlinear. There is a special case where it becomes linear under logarithmic transformation, but it's not always the case. So I'm wondering, you must have made an assumption somewhere along the way that pruned a very large class of control problems. And I didn't follow all the See where the pruning presented. was. Yeah. I'm guessing you started by saying that P dot is zero. You kind of assumed some kind of statistical equilibrium in the world, which doesn't have to be true. Could that be the yep. place where you actually ignore the law of control? Right. The, the, the two great questions, but the, la the very last few words were a completely different question. Um, no, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the same que question. Like, because a lot of the stuff, for example, the, a lot of the things that I showed, they cannot be cast as Bayesian inference. Right. Okay, well, I, I was treating on the first one. The, the P dot zero is, is more just a statement of um, the conditions that we need to comply with. So it do, it, I, I was careful to say non-equilibrium steady state. So we're not talking about equilibrium. We're, we're talking about systems that move and, and, and change and fluctuate. The notion that it's a steady state, that, that doesn't have to be true. The Why do you have to assume a steady state in the Right. By, sorry, so by definition, so if I want to talk about systems that have attracting sets, that have measurable characteristics over extended periods of time, basically they don't decay or dissolve. So that, that assumption was really to motivate the variational formulation of um, the hill climbing on surprise. So that was not a, a, a you know, pragmatic constraint over on, the, um, on the solutions that, 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 are, uh, that are used to illustrate the ideas. It's really a more fundamental motivation for where you get that fundamental hill climbing from in the first place. But it, doesn't, it does not entail stationarity. It does not entail... Uh, in, in either a wide sense or, or, or a weak sense. It does not in, in, entail thermodynamic or any other form of equilibrium. It's steady state in the sense that P dot zero, P dot is equal to zero. I think that the, the, um, the, I think the, you know, the more interesting question, I don't know, I, um, what, uh, clearly I haven't gone through the, um, the formalism that would map um, specifying the problem in terms of loss functions and how that translates into Bayesian inference. Um, 
However, the simple answer to that is that all the loss functions that are implicit in the illustrations here and elsewhere are all written down as log prize. So as long as you can write down your loss function in terms of a prior preference or a prior energy, the log of the prior belief, then by definition it becomes a Bayesian inference problem. So the question I think then for all nonlinear and dynamical models. Right. So, so th that's one of the conditions for doing this, uh, setting up this duality is that the en any energy cost has to be a KL divergence between some passive and some active dynamics. But there is another important requirement, which is that any noise that comes into to a system must live in your control space. In other words, if anything happened by accident, you should have been able to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that's actually a very strong assumption. So for example, if I'm a robot, I'm kind of shaking due to noise, but my motors could have made me shake in the same way, we can cast that as Bayesian inference. But if somebody came and pushed me in a way that I couldn't have pushed myself, all of a sudden that's not a Bayesian inference problem. It has to do with the, noi the structure of the noise and not just with the priors and the loss yeah. function. I mean, I'm going to have to defer to you technically. You know more about it. I haven't been doing this. I would say, though, that this pushing, um, you know, in the sense when we get new visual information, we are being pushed informationally via sensory. And, of course, the whole point of bit Kalman filtering and, you know, the generalizations of that. And I, um, of course, this is not Kalman filtering. This is, this is beyond extended Kalman filtering. In fact, it's in generalized coordinates of motion, so it's generalized Bayesian filtering. But that pushing is, of course, just from the sensory perspective, exactly the problem that um, generalized Bayesian filtering contends with and resolves. And uh, let me pose the question back to you. How is pushing the retina with visual information any different from pushing my proprioception by you know, a force to my body? Uh, my, my question is a bit naive, but uh, uh, if I understood well, the, your internal state is like the brain, the state of the brain, and the, the external state is the outside world of the brain, right? But the, the dynamics involves all states. So the attractor, for example, contains also the, uh, the uh, external state, the internal state, and the, uh, the in-between, right? So well, the internal states are actually just modeling the external states, not themselves. Say again? The internal states are understood as modeling the external states, but not themselves. Uh, because I saw that the dynamic model was including all states, and that the, the dynamics was including uh, like a Markov chain uh, with all states, right? Yeah, all states in the outside world, but yeah. not, not the states that are doing the, the modeling. That I didn't get that. Yeah. Well, th does it matter for your question? Because uh, because I didn't see uh, exactly in the equation that you had wh why the, the Markov blanket was playing. The, I didn't see what the, right. the, Markov, the Markov, Markov blanket assumption was really uh, coming into the equations. I see. So the, the leap there, again, I apologize for rushing over that. That's actually a very non-trivial, um, it's basically this thing here, isn't it? So, yeah, I think everybody would, would be, whoops, would be fairly comfortable, or they would after half an hour with a MATLAB or a pen and paper, they'd be fairly comfortable uh, with this. And it's really, uh, why is this still true? Uh, this uh, basically looks as if it has eliminated the external states. Remember S bar has the sensory active and internal states, but not the external states. And yet, um, the, um, this log probability depends upon the external states. So that's the clever bit. That's the non-trivial aspect of this result. So this result still holds true, and you have to go through and actually do the integration to show it in a non-trivial way. Um, so this has the same form as the previous equation. Oops, my apologies. So fx is a um, curly gradient descent on this thing here, where x comprises everything. Um, and this is also true. Um, but this probability distribution here depends upon the external states. So that's the clever bit in the sense that it's as if the internal states and the active states, or more um, the only clever bit, it's as if the internal states somehow know about the external states. They know where they are in the state space of external states. And yet they can't because that's beyond the Markov blanket. Uh, 
but the very uh, existence of non-equilibrium steady states means that this has to be true. And that's basically what gives these... Um, well, it, what it's, it, it, what it is what gives these systems, um, or certainly uh, a focus on the, the internal states of an other system and the Markov blanket, the look and feel of adaptive behaviour, the look and feel of self-organisation, homeostasis, and the look and feel of a little Bayesian agent. Uh, <coughs> Thank you very much again. And uh, my question is more naive than the previous uh, the, the person. The, uh, uh, you have the uh, very beautiful uh, explanation based on the uh, probability uh, principle. And the, uh, the, my question is the, uh, uh, how the biological neural network is implementing that uh, uh, probability reasoning mm -hmm. in the network. Is mm -hmm. it s the uh, deglutment principle or uh, or any other uh, uh, knowledge about how the neural system implement uh, this computation? Well, I think that's an open question um, and as open as the best scheme that one would uh, you know, adopt in a robotics context. Um, so what you're asking is what, uh, what is the, the, uh, the process theory that complies with the, uh, with, the, the, um, with the principle. I mean, the principle in of itself is almost uninteresting because it's tautologically true. I think the, the hard problem is really, first of all, the form of the generative models that you're dealing with and the actual scheme that is used to do the, uh, the, the, the variation um, um, free energy minimization, which could be selection using Bayesian model selection. Um, it, could, it, could, it could be, and I concur with the, the enthusiasm for Gauss-Newton schemes, uh, certainly all our simulations essentially use a Gauss-Newton scheme. Why? Well, because um, under the particular form of approximate Bayesian inference, which is not exact, given by assuming the posterior is always Gaussian, you can always write it down as a uh, in terms of minimizing prediction error. When you can do that, you can move from a, uh, you can move from a Newton to a Gauss-Newton scheme with all the computational savings involved. So you don't have to explicitly evaluate the curvature or the Hessian. So, and that rests upon the fact you've, you've made the surplus assumption in, the, um, in defining the variational free energy. So that's part of the approximation here. Masses of computational saving, all sorts of wonderful things just drop out for free under that Laplace assumption. Um, so we like we, in terms of neuroscientists and people with very small computers using MATLAB, like the, uh, like the predictive coding uh, formulation or Kalman filtering, applying a Kalman gain to a, a prediction error. Um, and uh, that is very understandable in terms of, again, I haven't got the right graphics here, but it's very understandable in terms of the sorts of message passing you see in the real brain. So these actually are usually um, thought to be equivalent to superficial pyramidal cells that live uh, about a millimetre from the cortical surface. Um, the expectations are thought to be encoded by deep pyramidal cells, which live about four millimetres in the deeper layers of the cortex. The, the visual cortex has exactly this hierarchical structure. It has exactly the right sort of laminar specificity, layer specificity, deep and superficial. It also has the right functional asymmetries. Remember before I was saying there are nonlinearities in this, but these are in the generation of a prediction error through the nonlinear forward model, which means that these descending predictions are nonlinear, whereas these are linear and driving, as in the Kalman filter. So, so I completely agree that in the macro model, the, uh, the it is uh, uh, well uh, investigated in neuroscience or brain science, but in the uh, very micro level, the, uh, the mathematical model of the uh, neurons yeah. and uh, a large cluster of neurons. I see. What, what can we, do we have, or do you have the, uh, the way to implement the uh, statistical reasoning into those uh, microscopic model of neurons? No. Um, so these predictive coding formulations would normally be, uh, would normally associate um, continuous time representations of, or uh, sufficient, sufficient statistics of the, of the posterior. <laughs> they would associate those with the activity of the neuron and so on. So it would be macroscopic, mean field approximation to large numbers, hundreds of thousands of neurons. 
there is a body of work, charity and by people at Silver Day and the like, um, but they're actually get into a single spike message passing and uh, associated that with uh, Bayesian belief update or belief propagation. The, the I think the formal distinction um, is between predictive coding and generalized Bayesian filtering schemes that deal with continuous states and continuous time, whereas most of the microscopic models that actually look at the sort of the neurochemistry of, of uh, postsynaptic responses, they only work for, for state space models with discrete states. You know, you're in state one in K with very very large vectors. So there's a formal distinction. Then then you're outside the game of fil uh, Bayesian filtering and predictive coding. So you've got you've got your choice. Yeah, so if there is no more question, uh, go to lunch now and we want to thank the speaker again. Back in the room at one forty five for the afternoon.